many people in Finland have told me, why should you fix something that isn't broken? We are getting very good PISA results and, and people are satisfied with their lives and so on. But the problem is that the world is changing and this is a global problem. I had, for instance, a couple of years ago, a workshop in Namibia about this topic. Um, that work life calls for collaborative knowledge creation. And even in Finland, the practices of school have been quite stable uh, for a century. And it's been really a challenge to, to change Finnish schools. Constantly, uh, there is a friction between conservative people who want to maintain it as it was. But we need creative and active citizens. And, and as uh, Professor Rothman mentioned, we really need people who can solve very complex and wicked problems. We had a major disruption during COVID-19. We are still in distance learning. Schools are open, but university uh, teaching is from distance. And we made a major digital leap during this year. I think I learned more in in a couple of months than I learned during the last uh, five years. But before this COVID disruption, we were really worried, and my research is very much focused on so-called digital natives, uh, young people who don't know the world without uh, internet and mobile devices. Uh, and our research is showing that for those kids who would like to use technology in their learning and who don't have the chance, their school engagement is dropping from grade seven to grade nine. And those kids who learn how to use technology for information seeking, um, their school engagement and their academic achievement is, is better than those who are less um, fluent in digital technologies. So that's a good message. So what did we do in 2016? Uh, we introduced interdisciplinary projects. Um, I talk about phenomenon-based learning because that's the way I've been training future teachers and Helsinki City has this phenomenon-based learning approach, um, but it can be other kinds of interdisciplinary projects. But I talk about things that I, I, I know best but also seven broad-based uh, 21st century skills I'm going to introduce. Coding became mandatory. Artificial intelligence, robotics. Uh, then there's something called science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. I've been visiting a lot in, in East Asia, uh, Korea, uh, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, mainland, even mainland China. So this uh, STEAM, projects, and in the United States, team projects are, are considered to promote creativity and productivity. Then we have the social digital revolution. We call it social digital because it's not about technology, it's also how social interaction becomes mediated by technology and how it changes the way we collaborate and how we create knowledge and how we are engaged with other people. Uh, if you look at our publications, we've been looking at uh, social media use and, and how to digitalize schools and things like this. But what is old and what is not being changed is the, the big role of art, sports, music. Uh, oh, there is sports twice. Uh, there should be handicraft. <laughs> Sorry, I was editing this. Handicrafts, uh, making things by hand, both, for instance, knitting and making woodworks and things like, uh, uh, things like that. And also home economy, meaning how to um, learn how to do domestic things like cooking or sewing, uh, things like that. And we believe that playful approach to learning with young children and, and even uh, gamification and still maintaining this uh, things that people do with their hands uh, foster innovation and creativity. But nowadays, external world is very much coming to school and school, school is going out from the classroom. And in the new schools in Helsinki, in Finland, we don't build classrooms. We build 
new kinds of learning environments that are more modern. And I'm going to mention that later as well. So what are the practices of these so-called digital natives? We've been following those who were born in 2000. Uh, they are now 20 years old, and we just sent them a COVID uh, questionnaire about how they are doing at the moment. Are they already at the university or how their um, school path predicted their future? But when we are looking at their ways of, of learning, they're very much multitasking. That's what we need to do here. I have this home studio now in the corner of, of, of my room and um, we need to really multitask a lot. Um, many people are reading from screens. Young people don't have bookshelves in their homes, which is a bit sad, but they read from screen and and there is one guy who actually got into law school last year and he had read all the law materials from his mobile phone. He couldn't afford to buy the books, but they were, um, they were uh, available online. By the way, my book is also an e-book. And uh, from my homepage, you can see how to have the e-book if you prefer reading from screen. Constant chatting, like we have a chat now. I At the moment I'm presenting, maybe I, I hope that Ian would be able to follow the chat and I'm going to have a little pause and then we can talk. Um, talk um, maybe already in the middle of this presentation if we have time. Um, gaming is one thing. 25% of these kids that were born 2000 in Finland are intensive gamers. And they don't li like play with mobile phones, they play with uh, consoles and, and PCs, computers. But all kids that we are looking at are very intensely uh, networked in social digital ways, which means that they participate through social digital interaction. They're constantly online. They're very dependent on mobile devices. Gamers are actually less dependent, but majority of kids are constantly checking, checking what's going on with their friends. Well, I just briefly, this is like a COVID time thing. Um, Prensky originally is the journalist who introduced this concept of digital natives and also this concept of backup education in 2008. Um, usually, we are concerned about what if the technology breaks down? Well, you can have a power interruption in South Africa. We can have, I have some internet problems today with my hotmail. Um, what will our kids do then? This kind of thing is a problem because when the teachers are actually saying is that they don't trust the technology of the future, we don't trust the world where our kids are going to live. We believe the way we did things is the best, uh, the real way. And that's what we want to teach our kids, the, the basics. But um, what the teachers actually were describing like 20 years ago, it's not like teaching the basics, but this kind of backup education to keep the old habits. Um, but um, those habits are now useful only in unlikely emergencies. What happened actually in COVID, backup, backup education went upside down. We were very wrong. We were looking for backup solutions in the case that the technology would fail us. But then COVID came and the physical school failed us. And we are still helpless in reforming our education to be meaningful and inspiring and free from time and space. And in Finland, I wrote a report to our parliament um, committee for the future, and there we are talking about hybrid solutions. So what is now needed is solutions where some people are staying at home and some people are at school, and how to teach these two groups simultaneously uh, in a seamless way. There are still problems in doing that. Though. So we are now working with hybrid solutions in Finland. Now we need some kind of backup system for physical presence of people. 
Well, the Finnish uh, 21st century skills that are in our new current curriculum, you can actually uh, find an open source tool on my website. And um, we, my group did it for Microsoft for their societal, with their societal funding. It's a present for Finnish teachers 2017 when Finland became 100 years old as an independent country. And um, the king of all these 21st century skills is thinking and learning how to learn. Um, cultural competence, inter interaction and self-expression are very important. Uh, but what we have, we have kind of levels of all this. It's a bit like Wi-Fi. Uh, level zero is not at all, and level three is very much. So you can test, for instance, what kind of uh, 21st century skills your institution is providing for the students. Uh, hardly any is at the level of three in all these skills, but um, self-care and managing everyday life, that's very, for some kids, it's, that is already challenging. Multiliteracy. When I'm now looking at um, at the U United States election for a presidential election, it's dreadful because what we are teaching in Finnish school, what is the proper way of tweeting uh, using social media, um, behaving online, offline, <laughs> uh, understanding different kinds of texts and different kinds of expressions. And it's not only about text, it's also pictorial, pictorial. so pictures, uh, kinesthetic uh, gestures, um, all kinds of uh, ways of communication. It's also ethical, um, how, how you behave. And that's very much integrated with using ICT and working life skills and entrepreneurship. But we are very much concerned with the sustainable future. Uh, Finland is a very green country. One example, our university president has turned all our university catering in vegan. So it means that there is no red meat available in our cafeterias. We are trying to have an environmental friendly diet. I gave up a meat like three or four years ago. Um, I, I, I actually noticed it was healthy, but this kind of idea that we are trying to um, also to educate uh, enlightened citizens who are understand the challenges of, of global climate change and things like that. Here is a list of these uh, competencies and sub-competencies, but, but you can study the tool that I, I provide. Uh, so there you can kind of reflect on what you are, what you are, um, what kind of practices you are enabling now. They're very different from what the Finnish 21st century skills are. Actually, we've been looking at the curriculum in Kenya and we did a project in Kenya with um, with um, World Vision, and, and actually their curriculum is pretty similar. But what they had trouble in how to implement all this, how to put this in practice, so that they are not not just nice words in their in the text, but also to make it kind of living. Well, sorry, I have this. I had this for Russian teachers. I was asking them, what are the Russian 21st skills that help to move towards the uncertain future about how we have always done it from what should we do now? But I should have changed this uh, ZA or uh, ZA um, uh, 21st century skills. Then we come to this phenomenon based learning. I spend a lot of time with this why we are changing and what we are changing and what are the broad based competencies to, to kind of motivate this phenomenon based learning because it's very difficult to teach all these 21st century skills if you are just slicing the world into silos of subject matter. Uh, we are not giving up subject matter teaching. I would say 85 to 90 percent of teaching and learning is still subject matter based, but uh, still um, 
we want to make use of the natural curiosity of children and youth. And children don't think, uh, they don't slice the world with subject matter topics. That's adult invention <laughs> by different sciences. And uh, usually children are naturally curious about some interesting phenomena like life. What is life? What happens to a squirrel uh, or antelope when it dies? Um, all kinds of questions that they have that may involve biology, religious studies, emotions, um, all kinds of uh, complex things that are integrated. In our phenomenon-based project, we also integrate art, sports, um, like physical education, music and humanities. So it's not only about science projects. And we figure that these are very important for learning these 21st century skills. It's, it's very much easier to integrate them in these kinds of uh, phenomenon-based learning projects. And the phenomena are studied in a holistic way, in, if possible, in a real authentic context. And for instance, in my husband, he's a school teacher, in their school, the phenomenon, the theme, the general theme was forest. So the children in each class could have like different phenomena they were studying, like nutrition, energy, um, sustainability, um, woodwork, whatever. So the starting point is this interesting phenomenon instead of um, traditional school set subjects, but the traditional school subjects are kind of integrated um, around this uh, phenomenon. So it starts from a larger phenomenon that can be really large, like what is life and death, and then integrates various subjects, like what is life from biological way, religious studies. Um, you can calculate odds ratios of survival in different countries. For instance, you can look the ra violence rates in so South Africa and in Finland and notice that, and life expectancies and, and hunger and things like that in different parts of Africa or, or the world. So we have only one or two uh, projects per year in the new Finnish curriculum, and uh, it's somewhat similar to STEAM which I explained that is very popular now in, in East Asia. And there are also, they have also kind of issue-based or societal-based problems. For instance, in Taiwan, Taiwan has a very similar, and Singapore, all these highly achieving uh, PISA countries are very similar. I've been teaching and learning from each other. I was in Taiwan, different parts of, of, of uh, that island and, uh, discussing how, what are the challenges of implementing something like this. They have challenge-based learning, like there is a societal challenge and complex and they're trying to solve it. I think Optensha is very much doing this, like having a societal challenge, how to make a community flourishing. That would be a phenomenon that you, that we actually study uh, from educational science, from sociology, from economy, um, psychology and so on. So what is different, and this has been different for many colleagues from different parts of the world, is this idea that phenomenon-based learning is process-oriented. So it's not about a product that we need to deliver a project. Um, it's very much about um, having a deepening cycle of learning, uh, creating a meaningful context together, defining a problem. And then if I would have more time, I was suggesting we could have a creativity work, workshop, but the idea is that in this process, you need to separate three and four. You need to separate uh, creative thinking and critical thinking. They are both important, but you cannot do them simultaneously. And you have to remember this brainstorming is before you learn. It's activating your previous understanding, creating a new working theory, revising your previous understandings. You're just kind of brainstorming what you think would be a good phenomenon, and then critically evaluating 
what was created and setting constraints. So first you're kind of opening your thinking and then you start, uh, for instance, selecting which school subjects or which broad-based competencies or 21st century skills you can integrate, for instance, in the phenomenon-based project. Then people divide the work, start investigations, deepening understanding, defining increasingly specified problems and the, creating new working theories. So instead of we asking who is right and what are the facts, we ask like even eight-year-old kids can ask, hmm, my working theory about why dinosaurs died out was, and then they start testing with their investigations, whether their working theory works. This is very different from this kind of black and white uh, reality where people are fighting about who is right and who is wrong. Uh, it's very much shared expertise where people have a shared goal and shared target of interest. They come from different angles. And there is research showing that highly successful Nobel Prize winning there is a classic study of Latour, for instance, sociologist, showing that this is the way actually um, the uh, also highly successful research groups work. And that's maybe one of the reasons that most of my PhD students are now uh, educational psychology majors who have studied five years in phenomenon-based way. They are excellent research team members. So we need to integrate these physical spaces, social practices, virtual and mobile ways of interacting, pedagogical models, and our ideas of learning. My basic research is very much on epistemic cognition. My latest research in higher education was about how university students approach learning and what knowledge is. Um, it's really interesting research. We, for instance, compared Taiwanese and Finnish teachers. We are writing a paper on that. So we need to create new cultures for schools and teacher education and research and workplaces from this gray um, offices and lecture halls into this kind of uh, Starbucks culture. In South Africa, in Taiwan, in Finland, every, you see young people everywhere sitting like that. You just need Wi-Fi and good coffee or tea and you can start working side by side with other people. So this is how my grandfather studied, and this is still how Finnish kids studied in 1990s. And this is something we are trying to get rid of. So how to engage the learners? We need physical, virtual, social, mobile and mental spaces of learning. Um, Many kids like to, for instance, lie down when they study. They don't want to sit so much because sitting is killing you. So we need to have different ways of teaching and learning, just uh, reading silently. And this kind of uh, webinar, it cannot be like two hours. It must be one hour because sitting in front of computer is not so good for you either. So... We can have these kind of design processes, for instance, designing schools or designing uh, research plans or research proposals. So it's process-oriented, phenomenon-based learning. It engages everybody, experts and users work together. I've seen actually this happening in many Optensha projects where experts and local people work together. Experts facilitate and analyze and create together with the, with the people. And, and there is this consensus kind of decision making. Uh, gather information, create a vision, choose different alternatives and choose the best and combine different kinds of ideas. And I think you're already doing this in uh, NWU, but maybe just kind of labeling it uh, phenomenon based. <laughs> it's another thing. So there are no fixed models. There is your community how it grasps its present life and how it sees what's the future and what learning is. And then based on my research, I would say that seeing learning as knowledge creation rather than knowledge transmission is the issue. The central is the conception of what learning and knowledge is. 
So this learning community is very different based on history, culture, but they have this shared phenomenon of interest and we need to know who we are reflecting from the basis of discussions and and learning community needs to define its own own future nobody can so promoting autonomy and agency of the community is very important